in approaching miking up a car, uh, we're, we're focused on capturing everything within that engine bay and the exhaust as well. So we've got an elevated chase camera, we've got bonnet view, and then we have multiple kind of in-cabin. We might even have a GoPro camera, whatever it is. So in order to disambiguate those, we'll be using impulse response for the cabin, for the elevated mics, you know, uh, we'll have obviously the exhaust and, uh, and depends on the engine configuration of the car, because it might be rear engine, rear exhaust, but we have to think about, you know, uh, the bleed that you would get. So again, there's a lot of reference um, referring to videos, obviously the session itself, so the pass by stuff we record. But in terms of placement, um, you've got to think about what the car engine is, essentially. If it's forced induction, if it's got, you know, twin turbos, if it's got waste gates, or if it's normally aspirated, we want to capture the engine, but we also need to isolate those facets of, of induction because that sits on top. So turbo, um, you know, a dump valve or a wastegate chatter, the spindle whine, even though you probably wouldn't hear it, and, and the whistle, um, you know, an intake and induction for forced induction system. Or if it's a, a supercharger, superchargers are completely, there's this dissonance between the engine and the supercharger, we call them bagpipes. You've got to basically apply a discrete miking approach in that way. You need to disambiguate between those and you want them those separately so that you can mix the taste or you can omit one from the, uh, from the actual overall mix. The other important consideration is airflow, heat, you know, the amount of room that you have available. Wind buffeting is obviously the en enemy of all exhaust, you know, mic channels. There are a lot of factors that kind of um, will influence where you're going to put the microphones, what microphones you're going to choose. It's, you know, you might want to you know, a focused, you know, super cardoid or something that can handle high, you know, transients, you know, that's, that's got that SBL handling. So again, that's another criteria for selecting mics. Clarity of reproduction, again, weatherproofing mics, creating bespoke enclosures for mics in order to protect them from wind, protect them from heat. So with the loadout for a, for a given car, I'll, I'll know what I'm recording. I'll look at the engine. I'll look at the exhaust. I'll check the specs, and then I'll, that will determine what I'm going to I'm going to what I'm going to bring to the session. I don't attach the exhaust mics with grips or ariams. I used to, but the the weight and load and drag and the uncertainty of them maintaining pressure or or you know locking adhering to whatever it is I'm anchoring them to is just too much worry. And we're reaching a point now with some of the historics and, and some of the top tier kind of classic motorsports cars where, I mean, they have significant appreciable value. They're works cars, so, you know, provenance is everything with those. So you change a rivet on them, then they just, you know, the value drops. So the owners, you know, are very, very anxious about stuff like that. So there's a courtship going on before that in trying to land the car and book the car and assuage any sense of worry you know, that the owner might have. So you've got to be very careful how you apply the mics, especially over the exhaust on the vehicle. So I'm, I'm using blocks of memory foam so I can build up a promontory. It's lightweight, memory foam is fire treated and um, you don't, you don't, you're not, your heart isn't sort of palpitating when you're thinking, oh, have, have I got vacuum pressure there? Or has he just pulled a hooning maneuver and I've thrown an Ari arm out of alignment and it's in the path of an exhaust, which I did once Unfortunately, it was a Sennheiser and it was a loaner from Richmond Film Services, so that was a lesson learned. But even with bungee cords on the arms and suction cups everywhere, you know, you get a manoeuvre or, or a, you know, a crosswind that could throw a mic out of alignment, you're in trouble. You can find that off-axis sweet spot on an exhaust, but also you're not close to the bodywork. You're getting a little bit of air between, you know, the mic and the car, depending on what you want that mic to do. So an omnidirectional mic, my mainstay is the, is the 4007, which is kind of like the glue, the foundation. So that's, that's the same in the engine as well. That's the firewall. So that's just everything within in that orbit of the engine. And then the spot miking, the, de the detail miking, or the more discrete approach to miking for forced induction or wherever it might be there. And then to capture bite or get a bit of detail on the exhaust, if it's very raspy, I use, I mean, Sennheiser uh, MD421, I use a lot of dynamics. Um, 440 is good as well, depending if you want something more more focused. I'll do an installation lap with the driver and then just start looking at the run plan. Um, and then I'll just review. I'll get him to, you know, once we've got the car, you know, up to speed, um, we'll get it to hit the limiter. So I know what, you know, what the, the threshold is on that. I'll be dialing everything in and then I'll go and review the recording. So I'll just make sure that the mics are all, you know, functioning. I mean, you, you can tell obviously just by, you know, from the metering where I mean, starts the light of a Christmas tree if you need to back off or what have you, but sometimes you get crackles and, you know, with some of the Lavalier mics. I'm, I'm trying to move away from some of the lav connectors, the bridging connectors on the DPA 4060s and 61s because of, 
they're compact, but the new dedicated series are brilliant. The MMC capsules, so I can get really good size. You know, the larger diaphragm capsules with the powered modular cables. I think headphones is probably what most people, what a lot of the kids and teenagers in the rooms, or or if they're in a you know in a flat or whatever, they're going to crank it up and play a game through. But I think. Most people are playing through stereo televisions or they might have a sound bar. The guys that are really into their AV, you know, the 20-somethings with money to burn or, or the guys who've got, you know, the vanity theater with 7.1 or whatever it is. I mean, that's that's the best way to play the game, but not everyone has access to that or not everyone can really play at that, that level. If we do our job right, then, you know, across all of those, you know, those formats, you know, across all the platforms, we've got a mix that would sound balanced and uh, would inform, you know, the, the player as well, because it's very important. You know, f f for all, you know, audio cues, not just um, telegraphing sounds that might be perceived as as some mech failure or some damage to the car or something lodged in the car that might get them to pause and think, maybe do I need to ease off? You might hear something imperceptible that could be construed as a, you know, a knocking sound, or it could be something, you know, detritus caught in your wheel well or, or you know, your brakes are going, or whatever it is, depending on the, the age of the car or the class of car. But it's this subjective perception. Of, um, of being physically present, you know, in the virtual environment. And when you forget about the tech, well, the fact that you're wearing headphones and you just, you know, you're just there, then we've done our job. Any forward thinking dev uh, will be looking at emergent technology and ways to, to improve the fidelity and that sense of immersion, that's that spatial, uh, all encompassing scope in audio. And Ambisonics is obviously, you know, a, a powerful tool in, in that arsenal of, you know, of. Uh, be it playback or be it for a means of capture, you know, to run within, you know, the, uh, you know, the audio build. A lot of VR, you know, bespoke VR projects, it's a no-brainer for that, but I know a number of, of recordists, you know, who are using that, again, as a tool, but those assets are being applied as a higher order ambisonic, um, you know, component within, within the actual uh, um, 7.1 environment. They could be preserved to output, you know, so further down, the line, if they decide to convert to VR, I mean, there are plugins now that Wise are supporting and, and endorsing that enable them to to basically, you know, follow through and and complete, you know, um, or create a VR mix. But if you're preserving those assets, uh, they're not decoded, but they're there within that matrix. Then, you know, you've had the potential to do that, or or using this plugin um, to push that, you know, that VR binaural uh, mix. With surround, you know, it's it's not truly 3D. Is it? we're, we're, we're dealing with two planes. I mean, we're excluding something like Ambio, but uh, but basic, you know, 5.1 stereo, whatever it is, 7.1. You're kind of getting to that point, but to be able to have that information, um, so we've got our vertical plane, and periscopic audio is, is that's those are the dimensions that you want for a, you know, if you're in a combat game or you've got a hail bomb flying over your head or whatever it is, that's just going to throw you into the scene. You know, you can be totally immersed and it's going to get the adrenaline rushing and to have that in a rally car if it's kick up or if it's detonations you know something backfiring or a splutter of overrun having assets that are recorded in the cabin space which is you know it just lends itself to that if i was to, to place an ambient mic which i did you know a rally cross event or a, or a touring car event if you know we have access to, to testing capturing that and capturing it in three hundred, you know in in the spherical surround you know ambisonic format it's far more desirable than, than just trying to hack it or create it with with stuff that you've recorded. It might be real, but it's it's not truly in that environment. You can worldize it, you can do whatever you want. You could use a, a surround mic, but it's not gonna allow you to go beyond that to the point where you've got those assets. And yes, you can shunt, you know, towards, you know, binaural. You've got that option, you know, it's about having you know, options, I suppose, providing a mix for the end user that they want for their home platform, whatever it is that these consumers are playing back on. We want them to be happy. We want them to get the best representation of, of the mix. The more authentic you can be, the more all-encompassing you can be with pulling in that content and adding the detail and the depth and the nuance. I mean, it's probably going to st stretch out the development cycle. We're going to have to have more employees, but it means we've got a bigger canvas to kind of, you know, to work with. and that. You know, that works across the board for, for you know, for the guys in graphics, for the particle guys, for the guys who do VF, VFX, you know, they can just run the gamut to have dynamic weather. I'm sure there's, um, you know, there's a lot of scope really for, for things moving forward. I mean, you don't have to run to any great expense. That's the, I mean, recorder level. I mean, you want, you want a low noise, you know, mic preamp, but uh, there are some really good consumer units 
that can get you up and running that have the firmware that enable you. Because obviously, you know, it's it's a fair amount of outlay you know, for any microphone of quality. Um, but once you've got that and you've got the opportunity to get out there and just get into environments that are interesting, you know, that are, that are layered. It's like a diorama. If you're enveloped in sound sources coming from your rear, fore and aft, it's you've got a depth of field. And, you know, it's got to be orally interesting. And those are the recordings that you're going to think, look back on that you've got in your library and you think, wow, oh yeah, I want to be, I want to use that, I want to put that to use. And just, you know, look for interesting opportunities. It's like a writer writes, a recordist records seize the opportunity when you hear it. You know, there's always something you're looking out for and, and you, you know, you don't know until you hear it. I think most sound designers are like that. I mean, practically everyone here has a, has a you know, has a little handy recorder or has an, a, you know, their own complement of mics. You know, I, I'm not the only recordist here. It's just that, you know, my role involves sourcing and recording cars, but whenever the other designers, or if they, if they can spare the time or they're permitted to, to break away, they'll come to a session, do an assist. They'll go and record their own stuff. Whatever the discipline they're working on, they'll, They'll go out there and look out, you know, look for the assets they want. So yeah, we like to record. It's the way we, it's how we roll. <laughs>